So, we discussed type 1 respiratory failure in the first video, and now we're going to move on to type 2 respiratory failure. And as I said in the previous video, type 2 respiratory failure is, if you like, proper respiratory failure. Um, it is proper failure of the entire respiratory system. So conditions that cause type 2 respiratory failure are going to be conditions that affect the whole of both lungs. So we're going to discuss two conditions to uh, extend our understanding of type 2 respiratory failure, and those two conditions are going to be asthma and COPD, and we'll begin with asthma. So asthma and COPD. So let's start by just drawing another picture of the lungs. So I'm going to give you a brief uh, explanation of what asthma is. Asthma is a condition of the tracheobronchial tree, so it's a condition of the pipes of the lung rather than the actual lung tissue itself. So let's just add on to our picture the pipes. So here we have the trachea splitting into the right and left main bronchi, and then those will split into smaller airways like so, and those will split into smaller airways still. So I'll just put a few more on here to make the picture look convincing. So what then is asthma? Asthma is a condition that the biomedical scientists are still exploring. They're still trying to understand it better. But in short, it is an inflammatory condition that affects the walls of the airways. So in people who are asthmatic, the walls of these airways, the walls of the bronchi, um, are going to have a chronic inflammatory process occurring within them. Now, that inflammatory process is not believed to be autoimmune in asthma. It's believed instead to be an allergic reaction. So the idea is that if you are asthmatic, you are allergic to something, uh, you're able to launch an immune response against something that you are breathing in on a regular basis. And for different people uh, with asthma, this is going to be a different allergen. So examples of things that we believe are allergens for people are pollen, uh, dandruff from animals, so um, dead skin cells coming off um, pets possibly, uh, all sorts of different things. Those are two key examples of things that we believe that are allergens. Indeed, human uh, dust, the dust mite, uh, proteins from the dust mite may well be allergens for many people as well. Uh, so, those are just some examples. The important thing is that in asthma, these individuals are launching an immune response against something that they're breathing in continuously, which people without asthma would not launch at such a profound immune response against. And this results in there being a chronic inflammatory process in the walls of the bronchi, and not just these massive bronchi that we've drawn on the picture, but also the much smaller ones that are much that are far too small to be on this picture, the bronchi and the, the small bronchi and the small the bronchioles as well, uh, they're all going to have this chronic inflammatory process occurring. Now, what does that actually result in? That causes problems with the airways. It makes the airways hypersensitive. So having this disease process occurring makes them hypersensitive, hyperreactive. And what can then happen is they can go through periods where they suddenly constrict. Uh, so remember, the walls of the airways have a muscle layer. So if I just actually draw a cross-section of an airway, so let's say this is a cross-section of the air an airway. So this is the lumen of the airway and this is the actual wall. So in asthma, you've got an inflammatory process occurring in this tissue here that makes up the wall of the airways. Um, and the walls of the airways also have a muscle layer. So I'll draw that in red here. And this muscle layer is capable of contracting and then that constricts the airway, and that's called bronchoconstriction when that occurs. Uh, and in asthma, bronchoconstriction occurs far too easily. So in response to certain triggers, they can have these bronchoconstricting episodes that normal people would not have in response to the same triggers. So what sort of triggers am I talking about? Well, breathing in suddenly really cold air could be one of the triggers that triggers off a bronchoconstriction episode, or um, breathing in pollution. If they're cycling behind a bus and breathing in all the fumes that are coming out of the bus, that would be potentially another trigger for a bronchoconstrictive episode. Or indeed, some people, when they're exposed to huge levels of the allergen that actually triggers the asthmatic process, the inflammatory process in the first place, that can then actually trigger off a bronchoconstriction episode. So all of these things can be triggers for these bronchoconstriction episodes that are more commonly referred to as asthma attacks.
And of course, if all of the airways constrict, that's going to cause real problems with getting air into the lung tissue, real problems with ventilation, uh, and that can result in type 2 respiratory failure. So let me just tell you the story. So asthma firstly is more common in younger people than older people. The immune system is generally stronger in younger people uh, and therefore you're more likely to have these allergic reactions. So let's say we've got a little child here. Let's say this is a poor 10-year-old child and this child has got bronchial asthma. By the way, the full name for asthma is bronchial asthma. So bronchial asthma is the pretentious, big, fancy, I'm writing a fancy letter, I'm going to say diagnosis bronchial asthma rather than just calling it asthma. So this 10-year-old child has got a diagnosis of bronchial asthma, so he's got this chronic inflammatory process occurring in his lungs, and let's say it's occurring because of an allergy to pollen. Let's say the parents don't quite realise the severity of this, they take this child out for a nice picnic in a meadow, and unfortunately the child is now going to be exposed to a huge amount of pollen. And what then happens is that pollen triggers off an allergic asthma attack. So when an asthma attack is triggered off by the allergen itself, we call that an allergic asthma attack. Uh, so all of his airways constrict, and now what happens, he has real problems getting the air through these constricted airways, because of course if the lumen's smaller, flow through it is much more difficult and requires much more energy. Now, children are absolutely incredible. Indeed, healthy humans are absolutely incredible. The ability to compensate is incredible. Initially, what will happen is the diaphragm and all of the intercostal muscles will work their socks off to pull with all their might and they will pull down hard enough that actually you get the air in anyway. So initially the child will compensate, their muscles will just work extremely hard and they will still manage to get enough air in, enough ventilation to actually mean that they don't go into type 2 respiratory failure. However, now at the if this was a happy story, what would happen is the child would now go to hospital because they'd be in extreme respiratory distress because it, you know, they'd be extremely breathless having to work really, really hard to breathe. So their parents would then realise there was a problem. So if, if this was going to be a happy story, they'd then take them to hospital and the hospital would give them medicines that they'd breathe in, which would um, stop the bronchospasm. They'd give them nebulised subutamol, uh, ipratropium, things like that, that are bronchodilators, which you breathe in these medicines and they work on the muscles and make them relax so that all the airways will stop constricting. That's the, and then they'll, and then child's asthma attack aborted, everything's fine. However, if we're going to tell the natural history of this story, it has a sadder ending, which is it ends with type 2 respiratory failure and potentially death. So, let's say this child is far, far away from the hospital and parents can't get the child there. What will happen is the child cannot continue compensating for the bronchoconstricted episode. The muscles tire, unfortunately. The diaphragm can only continue working phenomenally hard, and all the intercostal muscles can only continue working phenomenally hard for a short period of time. So eventually they will start to exhaust. Um, and at the point that they exhaust, then ventilation will be reduced. So when the diaphragm's losing its energy, it's not going to be able to pull hard enough against the bronchoconstrictive episode and then you will start bringing less air into your lungs and then ventilation will fail and type 2 respiratory failure will develop so you'll become hypoxic oxygen levels will go down and your carbon dioxide levels will go up um, so that then uh, is how asthma can give rise to type 2 respiratory failure and note this is failure of the entire respiratory system that will then give rise to type 2 respiratory failure contrast that to what we had here where it's just a small portion of the respiratory system that is failing. Now that's enough to cause a massive problem with oxygen, but it's not enough usually to cause a massive problem with carbon dioxide, so you only get type 1 respiratory failure, whereas in this one the whole respiratory system is failing, so you get type 2 proper respiratory failure, where truly the respiratory system is failing to do its job. Now, if an asthmatic goes into type 2 respiratory failure, it is a really, really bad sign. Um, because it means they're nearing the end, that, you know, their muscles are now exhausted, they cannot, cannot fight this anymore, and if your oxygen level goes down low enough, and if your carbon dioxide goes high enough, what's going to eventually happen is you're going to die, and the reason, that, uh, well, one, hypoxia uh, can trigger cardiac arrest, two, hypercapnia can trigger cardiac arrest, three, hypercapnia 
the more carbon dioxide builds up in your blood, the lower the pH of the blood. Remember, carbon dioxide can bind to water to make carbonic acid, which donates a proton away. So carbon dioxide is acidic, therefore, and will lower pH. Um, so the higher the CO2 goes, the more acidotic you become, and acidosis is very, very dangerous. It can precipitate cardiac arrest. So all of these things uh, are mechanisms by which type 2 respiratory failure is going to kill you. And indeed, if you have an asthmatic who is not responding to the medicines that for asthma. So remember, we talked about how we can treat asthma with bronchodilators, medicines that make the bronchi um, dilate and abort the constrictive episode. So examples would be salbutamol and ipratropium, which we usually give nebulized, uh, meaning they are put into a water vapor and the water vapor is then breathed in. If an asthmatic patient is not responding to these and they're still in respiratory distress, they're starting to exhaust, then what will happen is they will be taken to intensive care, they will be um, put into a medically induced coma, they'll be given drugs to make them go to sleep, a general anaesthetic, and then they'll have a tube put down their throat, an endotracheal tube, an ET tube, uh, and we will, we will ventilate them, we'll attach them to a machine that will breathe for them, it will force the air into their lungs, and therefore it doesn't matter that their muscles are exhausting, we will breathe for them. And that's how we can ultimately treat asthmatics that are not responding to bronchodilators who are in type 2 respiratory failure. So there we go, one condition that gives us a good example of type 2 respiratory failure. Uh, let's now talk about COPD, um, which is the other big one um, that causes type 2 respiratory failure. Again, it's a condition of the entire lungs. So COPD is different. This is older people who get COPD. Asthma is young people, COPD is old people, but COPD is very similar to asthma. COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which I can't really be bothered to write out in full. And it happens from years of smoking. Smoking is what causes COPD. And really, it's a mixture of two conditions combined together. It's a mixture of a condition called chronic bronchitis and uh, a condition called emphysema. The combination of these two is called COPD. And different people with COPD will have different proportions of the two. Some people have a very emphysema-predominant COPD, and others have a very chronic bronchitic um, predominant COPD, and others have a mixture of both of them equally. Um, both of these processes result from smoking, and that's the reason that you've combined them together into this broader term, which is COPD. So what is the basics of happening? Years and years of smoking uh, damages the lungs. Everyone knows this, um, but how? what are the actual um, physical changes that occur uh, from years and years of smoking. Well, these are the physical changes. Chronic bronchitis is a chronic narrowing of the airways. So in people with COPD, their airways get thicker and thicker. Whoops, spraying uh, ink everywhere, uh, virtual ink everywhere. So in people with COPD, their airways become like this permanently. So you see, this is the airway of a nice, healthy child here, uh, nice and wide until they have an asthma attack and all the muscle constricts down. In people who have smoked for years and years and years, the airways are chronically getting damaged by all the toxins in the cigarette smoke, and they start to scar up. So they build these layers and layers of scar tissue within the walls of the airway, and that means that all the airways gradually become narrower and narrower and narrower. 